Welcome back to the Behind the Well Show. I'm your host, Roger Abel, co-host Elias Randall with me again. Elias, the market's moving again. Yeah. But in a different direction. Okay, what do you mean by that? Like the last couple of days? Last couple of days. It's, it's just this little glimmer of hope that the market might return back to some level of normal trading pattern and not just the relentless selling we've seen for like the last seven weeks. So what do you call these when the market, you call them bear market rallies when we get a little rally up during a bear market? And Yeah, that's probably what this is, but there's just this glimmer of hope that we might get back to a normalized trading pattern. Hey, when I look at the screen at the end of the day and I, I see green numbers, I know it, it calms my nerves and makes me feel better. So I'm sure it makes clients feel better too. So this morning on my way in, I was reading an article or an article came into my um, inbox and it was by JP Morgan. And this is the headline that I'm going to let you, let you tell me what you think about this. And I didn't send this to you before the show. JP Morgan says retail investors are finally bailing on stocks. That's the headline and said, this is the fastest pace retail uh, investors have pulled out since 2000. Um, even the ones who've been buying the dip. So there's a certain amount of people that all the way down, they've been buying the dip because that's what's worked for the last 10 years. Every time there's a little drop in the market, you buy the dip. Well, now they're finally giving up. There's finally capitulation and capitulation that's people don't know for a bottom. Basically they're surrendering. What do you think about that? And, and I know what my thoughts are, but what are your thinking? Th thoughts on that, I guess. Well, so a, a couple things. One, you know, people have been talking about capitulation and that could be a sign of that. Um, I think in general, like the height of pessimism and then retail flows leaving the market would be a sign of that. Sometimes that can signal a bottom. Um, it doesn't guarantee that that's where we are. But my other thought, and I shared this with someone the other day, it's actually a listener of our show. He, he was saying he really appreciates our content and likes every, the stuff we talk about. And he goes, you know, it's really interesting that how negative it makes me feel when I'm buying into a down market. But from listening to your guys' content, I know that that's the best thing that I can do right now. So I shared with him, well, there's money to be made in a bear market. You just can't be scared to make it. So the first thing that came to mind right here for me is the old Warren Buffett saying, fearful when others are greedy, greedy when others are fe fearful. So I went and Googled the emotion of investing chart. We, You may have seen this before. I don't know if you have, but Russell Investments has one. We'll have Molly put it up on the website. You can get it at btwellshow.com. But here are the series of events that leads to market peaks and valleys. Okay. So I've seen something similar. We start with op recently. we start with optimism, then we go to excitement, then we have the thrill, and then the peak is euphoria. And for us, euphoria was basically in the fall, fall is of that, last year. Nothing could go down. Nothing bad could happen. Who put that? Well, this is out by Russell Investments. By Russell. By Russell. Okay. There, and if you go Google emotion emotions of investing, it comes up everywhere. After euphoria, we have denial. And so let's think about this. Denial was December. Well, it's just a blip. Everything's still okay. Then we hit anxiety because now the market's really going down. Fear, then depression, and then panic, which is we're in this panic phase, in my opinion. Like people are like, okay, what do I do? And, and we know what successful investors do. They increase 401k contributions. They add money to their accounts or they just do nothing to be successful. Then panic, capitulation, which is basically what this JP Morgan article is telling us, and then despondency. And despondency is the absolute bottom of what's going on. And then we start the trend back up. We go to skepticism. So hey, what I just say, hey, we've had three days of a we we have we've had three days or four days of a market green markets. And your question was, well, what is this a bear market rally? Well, I'm skeptically optimistic that it's not. I don't know, but there's a skepticism. <laughs> so yeah, maybe I'm I've probably. crossed the corner. Then hope, relief, and optimism. The problem is with clients and human emotions is once they hit anxiety, fear, and depression, panic, they're selling. People and start, they start to exhibit bad behavior. 
And then when do they start to buy back in? In the, the optimism most, stage. They're yeah. not they're not buying in in hope or relief. They just got out. Now they're getting back in, in the optimism stage. And it's why you can go back to all of the research out there. It just shows you can't time a market. Human emotions just don't let us time a market. But I just thought that was interesting as I came into the office this morning. It came through on Think Advisor. I'm like, man, I, I don't know if this is the bottom. But when you start to read articles like that and you're flushing out retail investors, at some point it's got to be close. And I think the just overall excuse me, overall environment, it's starting to feel like a bottom, right? With the negativity on uh, financial media, all of the, you know, this, some signs of capitulation with retail investors, that JP Morgan article leaving the stock market. So it's certainly starting to feel like a bottom. Um, I wish, you know, I wish I had the crystal ball and I knew what day the market was actually going to bottom because that would make our job a lot easier. But it just it, it goes back to investing can be as simple as controlling your emotions and controlling your behavior. And that's what successful investors do time and time again. So I, th I said it earlier, but, you know, there's opportunities in bear markets. And especially, okay, so anyone what, yeah, younger than 50 years old, should this even be something you're worried about? Why are you leaving the market? That's such a great, over time has proven to be such a great place to grow your wealth and your net worth over a long period of time. Um, you should continue participating. There's no, this is no time to leave. If you're going to leave, you should have left at the height. Here's the other thing I'd like to really caution people about trying to find a bottom. If you find the bottom in the market from an investing standpoint, it's pure luck. You shouldn't be worried about buying the bottom when the market's down 25%. You should be worried about it. If it goes down another 10% and you missed out buying at 10% lower, in the long-term scheme of things, I'm talking about in the next 12 months, like you'll feel bad if you, you know, bought in was a minus 25 and went to 35% down. You'll feel bad for like a year. But in 15 years, that one purchase really is not going to have any bearing if you missed out on the bottom of the market by 10 or 15 percent just doesn't matter in the long term right. but what's and everybody want to do i mean we've had multiple people well i want to see if it goes down a little bit or see if it goes up a little bit now what you're really telling me is you're just scared right. you're scared to put money in and you're 37 years old and you should just be putting whatever you can in the market now that you can afford to invest and set yourself up for the long term. Yeah, and if you think about how most investors are doing it, most people it's through a 401k plan. So what's max contribution on a 401k like 19,500 for personal contributions and then with catch up. Yeah. So let's just say it's let's just go with the 19,500 for people under 50. So, well like 1800 bucks a month in the ballpark. So if you miss out on like you're just saying, if you miss out on 10% on those on those little contributions here and there, you know, it's not like you're missing out on 10% on a one-time purchase into the market at a million or $2 million. That's a much larger decision. But even, even okay, if I had a 37-year-old, 35-year-old, 40-year-old, who's going to have this money invest for 20, 30, 40 years, and they put a million bucks in. Still a non-event. Still going to be a non-event yeah. in 20 or 30 years. It'll be an event right? It will be an event for the next year or two years. If it goes down another 10 or 15% from where they put it into, we had clients that put large, large contributions in to start the year. Yep. It's painful for them in the long term. They'll be fine. In 20 years, they will be like, that was a great buying opportunity. I mean, you look back 10 years ago, think about 10 years ago, go back to actually the, the height of the market, 2009, before it crashed, what was it like? 12,000, 13,000. It was before a great buying opportunity. 09. Yeah. yeah. Before the market went down, it was a great buying opportunity. Everybody would go back and buy it. What about before yeah, so the you're tech? comparing the height? Yeah. The height I'm, of that market compared to where we're at today. Yeah. It was a you're great buying better, opportunity. Yeah, you're still it better just, off. Over time. It's typically a great buying opportunity. You know, I watched that Dave Ramsey clip again last night about someone said, I'm waiting for home prices to come off. And Dave said, the house is never going to be less expensive than it is today. Might not go up drastically, 
but there's too many factors preventing these homes from going down. We covered in a previous episode of the show that if you, if you haven't caught it, you can go to btwellshow.com and catch the podcast or the YouTube show. But we cover that in another show. All the things supporting the housing market, even though people think it's going to collapse, just because the price of something goes up doesn't mean it has to come down. You're, yeah, just be yeah, right. That's not really. Yeah. Price going up isn't a metric of value. It's the same thing as an individual stock. Just because an individual stock goes down in value does not mean it has to come up. Typically, indexes do. Diversified investments do. But just because something goes down in value doesn't mean it's time to buy when it's an individual stock. So I do want to share. I do want to share a story because I think it's kind of insightful. This was because we've been sending out letters to clients, and I think this for for our listeners, this really goes to show like clients that buy into our philosophies and listen to our advice, and um, you know they understand that we're doing what's in their best interest. And we, so the, one of the letters we sent out was about the volatility in the market. And one of our clients, who's probably one of our most successful clients, responded back and said something like, laugh out loud. I don't have time to worry. I'm hanging out on a beach. Yeah. So just like, listen, so f for the way that person's doing business, right? And like the contributions they're making and their responses, I'm more concerned about my day at the beach today than what's going on in the market. To me, that's in insightful to how successful investors approach investing because you can't control the market, right? We talk about it all the time. You have no control over that, but you do have control over, I'm going to choose to not worry about it and I'm going to, I'm going to enjoy my time. And I just remember when you told me about the response from that client, I thought, well, that's awesome. I don't know if I would feel the same way, but that is great that that's how he feels. Well, you know, I think that was like three or four weeks ago when the selling was really intense and we yeah. sent a, just a special letter out to everybody just talking about it and trying to calm the fears. And be, beyond just, hey, I'm not worrying about it, it was like, it must be ugly in a bloodbath for you in your office. You must just be getting <laughs> bombarded with calls if you're sending me out this letter, which that wasn't the case. We were just trying to be proactive, which we did the same thing during COVID. You know, when things get really crazy, we just try to give some context as to what we feel and try to help people exhibit good investor behavior. One of the things, though, I, and I didn't even know this was happening, but um, CNBC threw an article out there and it was titled 401k savers will see a wake up call in their next statement. And before I read the context of this article, I thought it was a oh, wake up call. My account, my account's going to be down 15% from the last one because a lot of 401k statements come out quarterly. But what's act actually happening is a lot of these 401k statements now are going to include lifetime income illustrations or basically an estimate of what somebody would expect to receive in a monthly payment from their investments. And I think this is good because you can have a person that has a half a million dollars and they feel like they're wealthier. They have a million. They think they're rich, right? You had a million bucks. You, I mean, whatever makes somebody feel they're rich or wealthy or 2 million, whatever it is. But when you give them what the monthly amount they can take out is. It's a different picture. And it's a more accurate picture because, you know, just because you have a half million dollars, if you don't treat it wisely or a million dollars, you don't treat it wisely. You're going to blow through it. It'll go fast. I've watched it happen to people. I have multiple people I've seen where they didn't pay attention to their plan and they blew through it. Yeah. So I was, I was actually kind of caught off guard by the article because at first I thought the same thing you yeah. thought. So my first thought just reading the headline was, well, they're not going to be surprised. Everyone knows we all, everyone logs into their account nowadays. And some people wait for the statement in the mail, but most people are just logging in and looking. So I don't, I was thinking, well, I don't know how big the surprise, but I thought, well, that's very insightful that actually showing people the outcome instead of just the value of the money in terms of an income illustration, because well, that and, would be your future distribution off of your money. And I'm going to tell you what I think my concern here is going to be. So this is actually policy as a result of federal leg legislation in the SECURE Act, which was passed in 2019. So this is going to be on these statements. But it's going to be a single life annuity example or an annuity example. Well, that's actually more than likely going to be a higher withdrawal rate 
than if somebody doesn't annuitize their money. And what I mean, if you put $100,000 into a lifetime annuity, it's probably going to have a higher payout than if you figure out the safe withdrawal rate that you could take out so you don't run out of money. Because when you annuitize a lifetime annuity, it, it, you basically turn it into your own pension plan. So it actually could be not as accurate of a reflection for an individual because not everybody wants to give up control of all the money in their 401k and say, oh yeah, I'd love to give it to an insurance company and never see it again. I'm not saying that's not a meaningful planning tool, but most people's expectation is they're not gonna take their million dollars and hand it over to an insurance company and never have access to it again. So if they run a lifetime income annuity illustration off that, it may be giving people a false sense of what they can take out. So with that said, that is why we do full financial plans for people. And we put together a retirement income distribution strategy as I get near that stage. And this year, for, for the last like 10 years, your distribution strategy didn't matter. The market went up, you could sell a winner. Well, this year, everything's down. Unless you own cash, every single asset class is down. Bonds are down. I guess I shouldn't say every single asset class. Energy's up. Most asset classes from a diversified portfolio are down. Bonds and stocks are down. Well, if you had an income strategy with a cash bucket, you'd still be okay. But right, the last 10 we, years, you haven't had to do it. So, And that's one of the, sorry, what's that? Well, if you haven't done a financial plan, you can go to btwellshow.com and get a plan and get a distribution income strategy because it's critically important. These illustrations that are going to be on 401ks, once again, are non-reflective of your individual circumstance. And, and for the last 10 years, call it. So whether it's our podcast, YouTube, our radio show, we talk about distribution strategies and the importance of cash. Well, for the last 10 years, people could just basically like sell whenever you wanted. Like you're saying, like you wouldn't, you necessarily didn't, you didn't necessarily need to have 12 months worth of cash. You could just kind of systematically sell it monthly as you needed. And it was never really harming you over the last 10 years. So there was probably, I'm sure there was times where it was easy to say, well, that's what you guys say, but I've been doing it. It's been working. And this year it's kind of like, yeah, that, that can work up until the time where it doesn't all of a sudden work anymore. And I think 401ks are great. I watch things out there on TV or social media and their advertisements, why 401ks are horrible. And they're just trying to sell you some other product. At the end of the day, the 401k is designed to help the American worker save for retirement. But there are some issues and that's one issue. I mean, I like that they're going to quantify it because some people think, oh, I have a million bucks. I'm good. And then when it says, well, you get to spend 40,000 a year, they are like, oh, wait, maybe I need to rewire how I think. That's why we get a financial plan. But the second thing that happens is 401ks are some sometimes you get a false sense of security. And I'm going to give you an example. Elias, what do you think? the average client investor in a 401k who owns a life path 2025 fund or a target date 2025 fund. What do you think they believe their allocation is to bonds? How safe do you think they believe that fund is? I, if they were quantifying percentage, I would guess they would probably guess 50% in bonds or more. See, Maybe I think even I higher, think higher concentration. I mean, when people come in here, they're like, oh yeah, I'm really, really, I'm really conservative. I've got the 2025 fund. I'm really conservative. When I think really conservative, that's like 20% stock. The average 2025 fund has between 50 and 55% in stock. So let's just think about it. If that client thinks they're conservative and they own 50 to 55% in stock, they're thinking, hey, you know, yeah, the market's down. I should be doing okay. And I'm not picking on anybody, but I just picked the BlackRock Life Path Fund because it's in a lot of 401ks. The 2025 Life Path Fund down 15.7 percent, and that's what 50 percent stock or 50 percent stock, 50 percent bonds. I went and looked at the Vanguard one; that was 55 percent stock, 45 percent bonds. So you can get lulled into a 
lulled to sleep thinking, hey, I'm just sitting in this thing. It's going to get more conservative as I get older, which it is. But it doesn't mean it's meeting your individual goals. Yeah. I mean, it's it is certainly... just a plain vanilla. The 401k, the reason these funds, the reason target date funds are in 401ks are to keep employers out of trouble and custodians and fiduciaries. That's yeah, that's the real reason. Hey, it's more conservative as people get older. Does that mean it's the best thing for you? I don't know. The only way to find out if it's good for you or whether you should be invested in that is having a full financial plan done. Figure out what your risk tolerance is, what your goals are, what the proper asset allocation is, and just dial this into your needs. It goes back to if you think, if in, investors think, or retirees or pre-retirees believe that there's just an easy way to do this and you don't need help, you're mistaken. And you can be right nine out of 10 years. You could have been right the last 10 years, but this year could be devastating if you didn't do the right thing. Were you right or were you lucky for the last 10 years? That'd be my question. No, I. you know what? I think most people are right for 10 years because people are probably right 80% of the time because that's when the market goes up. If you have too much risk and the market's going up, that's a good thing for you. But what yes. happens when it goes down, you don't have a distribution strategy. And now, now you're looking and saying, well, what do I sell now? Because bonds are down, stocks are down. Whatever I sell, I'm gonna lock in a loss. I, I'll never have a chance to make it back. There is no plan. I've had new clients coming in. They have no distribution plan. It's just a managed account and it's with a great company, great investments, but there's no strategy. So guess what we have to do now? try to figure out which one to sell that's down the least. We're chopping off branches off the apple tree that will never produce apples again. And so the target date, target date funds are fine, but they're not tailored to anyone. That's, they're not unique. They're not tailored to an individual situation. I think it's misleading. Because of it provides a certain level of comfort. Is I think it's misleading. Think it's I think it says, hey, it's a 2025 fund. People think it's safe. People don't think about their investment going down 50% two or three years before retirement or 15% or 20%. I think people yeah. don't look, they don't pay attention. Most advisors wouldn't know it was 50%. In the target date fund? You I'll don't bet think you, a lot of advisors I'll bet you if you that? go, if you go and just said, hey, what's a 2025 target date fund? What's the allocation? What's the, what's a 2020, 2020? I, I pulled up VITWX, Vanguard Institutional Target Retirement 2020 Fund. That's a Vanguard 2020 Retirement Fund. It's still 41% stock. I think a lot of people who are five years past retirement would, and I'm not saying that's a bad allocation. It's probably appropriate for most people. I believe most people would believe it's more conservative than that. Think about what clients say to us when they come in here and they're not working with an advisor because the people that still have this fund they don't work with an advisor. They're doing this themselves. Well, I'm 10 years from retirement or I'm five years from retirement. I can't, can't really take much risk here five years from retirement. They say it all the time. And what do we say? Well, yeah, but retirement does, you know, retirement's not the end. You have a long time horizon, which that's what this is reflecting. But people's expectation is that if I'm in a fund that's five years past my retirement or three years past my retirement, probably be really conservative which it is a conservative allocation it is i just don't think clients think it's do clients think that can go down 15 percent? probably not there you go they, or 10 percent or whatever it is so i just think that the target date fund in general people have a false sense of reality i don't like target date funds and 401k plans if you're working with someone if you're doing it yourself i mean you'd have to do some research there's only one place that i actually personally use a target date fund. I use a target date fund in one investment. I know what it is, but 529 plan. Yeah. And the only reason is in most people who save in a, a college savings plan for their kids, I never check the account. My other investments I check them all the time. I never log in and check the 529 plan. It's really weird. And I, I pull clients. How often do you check the value of that? Well, I don't. That's why I'm using a target date fund. Because that one I actually want to roll back. I'm conscious that, hey, when they're 18 years old or 19, it's still going to be 50% stock. That's okay. I just don't want to leave it 100% stock because I never checked it. 
Yeah, it's so a weird paradigm. I psycho- never check it. Psychologically, there's maybe a little more disconnect because in your mind, you probably don't think of that as your money because you're saving it for your kids where your retirement accounts and your investment accounts, that's your money. So you look at it, which for the college savings, like you've already written it, not written it off, but like that's for my kids, that's their money. It's 100% right. Yeah. It's actually probably the best investor behavior we have because we don't worry about it. I'd actually be curious. This would be good to, maybe we can get the research from one of the companies that we work with. 529 performance results versus average investor performance results. Because I feel like most people just don't check those because like you, you hit it on the head. It's not my money. It's my kid's money. Not that I'm not concerned about my kids. I'm less concerned about their money than mine. It's that's human natural. nature. Yeah, that's human, human nature. nature. It's not yeah. bad. Right. And I'm ma- making sure it's being responsible. But I man, if anybody out there wants to go and give us their input at the website, you should do it because we, we cover it on the show. I just think that very few people pay attention to those. So that's the only place that I believe a target date fund is really good. Um, if you're doing th- doing this yourself, I guess it's good. You should just know what you own. And, and I'm not trying to beat up on them. I just think it's a little bit of false sense of reality and hope for most people. Right. And they're all, you're also, when you buy a target date fund, you're just quantifying, well, I should be in the conservative fund because of my age. Well, there's a lot more that goes into financial planning and portfolio management than just age. So that allocation could be right. It could be too conservative and you don't really know those things. If you're only making decisions based on age, that's only one metric that goes into financial planning and portfolio management. So again, it's just not a tailored approach. Well, it's just really a very bland approach. If you start to think about, you know, how do you, I mean, we, we've kind of morphed into, we're talking a lot about retirement planning today, but there's really like 11 figures you should know to figure out if you're going to have a secure retirement and let's just cover them quick. One, what's your break even social security age? Should, should know that. Here's the challenge with, with Social Security and determining what the break-even is. You can determine what the break-even is, but we don't know how long you're going to live. If we knew how long somebody was going to live definitively, financial planning would be very easy. It's the number one thing that we can't can't plan for. We can't plan for how long somebody will live. But, and so, that's the second one. <laughs> yeah, second well, one I already covered two. How long you live? Don't know. Like that's I guess the, you should know that. We use age 93 and 95. Now we have questions before we do this financial plan about longevity and what's your family history and all those things. And I guess I take personally more of an actuarial approach to it. If somebody comes in here at 60 and they've had two heart attacks, a stroke and diabetes, while I may plan for that person to live to 93, the odds are they won't. And I'm not being disparaging in any manner. And and I ask people this when I ask about their health. I said, if you applied for a life insurance policy today, not that you're going to, we don't really sell much insurance, but if you applied for a life insurance policy today, would you get a standard rate or a substandard rate? You know what? Well, I've tried to get insurance before I got declined. Okay. That means your life expectancy is less than the average. Doesn't mean you won't live past the average. It's actuarially you won't make it to the average. Yeah, it, yeah, basically, yeah, it just means the insurance company wouldn't expect you to. Right, so why would I mean. why would we plan on that expectation as well? Uh, so we just take a tailored approach to that, where it's, once again, I made the joke 12 years ago, I was in a workshop and I said, you know, if financial planning was as easy as just entering data in the computer and spitting out numbers and everybody could figure it out, I'd be the first person to put a computer program together, put it on the internet and just start printing greenbacks. It's just not that easy to figure out. Like you have to have a human component to interpret the data and tell you what the data means for your specific situation. Yeah. Or I mean the rise of just like even uh, robo advisors, there's robo advisors out there, but I don't know that people really care for that. You mean what you get a a formula and a 1-800 number? How many people have we had come in here recently? I had a robo advisor, but I really want to be able to talk to somebody. It's not like one or two. It's It's more than it's picking up. And robo advisors caught a little steam, not that much steam. I think there's more robo advisors being used by 
financial planners today as a third party platform than individuals going and seeking that out. You, I know of multiple planners that use Betterment as their platform. So you think there's more people doing that than retail investors? I would guess it's where a lot of the flow is. What's the average retail investor going to go there with? Right. Yeah. Not much. I mean, on an individual basis, right? Three, how much guaranteed monthly income you have? These are your social security, pension, stuff like that. If you've done an annuity or something, any of that stuff, guaranteed monthly income. And you might have income that's not guaranteed. That's important to know. Like what's the variable income? You could have rental income from a house, from a real estate, from farmland. There's a whole bunch of other incomes that come in there. We just don't call it the guaranteed income. Uh, and four, this is probably one of the most important things today. You know, for the last 20 years, no one's thought about this. What's the actual inflation outlook? For, yeah, for the short term or the long term? Yeah, I mean, you can model short term, but you have to look long term. I mean, do we really think inflation will stay at 7 or 8%? I don't know. No, I don't believe that. I don't believe that, but... I think it will for a while. The I mean, good news that. is, if you have good planning software, you can model it. You can see what it does to your portfolio. You can plan for the worst. Yeah, I did a financial plan for a young individual the other day, and husband and wife, they're teachers or professors, really. They're not teachers, they're professors. They uh, they both have pensions, good pensions. He's like, I'd like to disregard the pensions from all of our calculations. Why is that? Want to take personal responsibility for a saving. Listens to Dave Ramsey. If you listen to Dave, he's like, just don't depend on your pension. The rules can change. They get change of benefits. A lot of these pensions are underfunded. He's going to meet all of his retirement goals without the pension. So what he's doing is he's modeling. What's the worst case scenario? His probability of success was 99% without the pensions. And he asked a question. He goes, you know, we're throwing 1500 bucks a month on the house extra. Do you think we should like roll that back and invest it? And I said, because he asked what would be a better rate of return. Like, where would they make more money? I said, well, is it really about making more money? I mean, if it is, the answer is easy, but I'm sure there's more to it than. Yeah. I mean, clearly, just the if, rate he of invested, if he invested the extra 1500 a month in the market, more than likely, he'd probably make more money there. But he likes the idea of having a paid for house. And I was able to say, well, your probability of success in retirement is 99% without your pensions. It kind of answers a question for you. You don't really have to save more. You can afford to put the extra 1500 bucks on the house. And here's what the question, how we got to it, Elias. He listens to two, he listens to Dave Ramsey and the money guys. I said, oh, I listen to the same people. <laughs> yeah. Well, Dave Ramsey says 15% of your income and the money guys say 20. So he was trying to figure out, should he do 15 or 20? I said, well, this is the beauty of doing this financial plan. We don't have to guess on the percentage. Let's model the percentage. So it was kind of a cool conversation um, that I got to have with him. Well, that's cool that he follows uh, Ramsey he's follow and us the too money. Now. Yeah, and the money guys. So he'll be getting, he'll have three good sources of uh, his financial content. Yeah, you know what? None of us are really disagreeing with what other people say here. It's just their own little spin on what it is. I don't think we just mass disagree with anything that money guys say or Dave Ramsey for the most part. Do we agree 100% with all of them? No. All right, but that's life. Everyone has their own philosophies and their own way of planning and doing things. You know, I was at ELP for Dave for, for years, and I just said, you know, I believe in a lot of what he says, but if Dave tells me to go off the bridge, I'm not going off the bridge. That's called thinking for yourself, isn't yes. it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Five, you should know rate of return on investments and not what your investments are doing, but in general, what kind of rates of return should you expect from different asset classes? So this, um, this rate of return point here, this also made me think of the 401k article, article where it said rewire your thinking. I think we've all gotten used to this higher rate of return in the market and your long-term expectations for returns should be more in line with the historical averages. Because we may very well see over the next 10 years that the, people call it mean reversion, whatever you want to call it, that maybe returns won't be as great as they have been. But 
can you probably count on closer to historical averages? And that is that how you should plan? I do believe you should plan on that. I don't think you should model out 14% annualized returns and then expect that to happen. Last night I was listening to compound, the compound. What are your thoughts? And they started talking about the death of the 60, 40 portfolio, which we've seen all of these articles, death of the 60, 40 portfolio. It's over. You know what the 60, 40 portfolio after this year's like, you know, the 60, 40 portfolio down is probably down 15 to 18% this year. Well, are you talking about future outlook on no, 60, 40, the past 10 year averages, even with this bad year this year. Oh, it's still done. Well, it's like seven and a half percent. It's right in line, right? It was running above average. This has just brought it right in line to its historical average. Well, and actually outlook for bonds is getting better. Well, so, remember what bonds are supposed to do. Bonds are supposed to provide some level of safety and pay income. Well, if we start getting back to our bonds, pay three, four, five, three, that's low, 5% on a bond, corporate bond paying five or 6%. That's going to help the everyday investor. That's oh, yeah. going to help that 60, 40 portfolio because for the last 15 years, really the last, okay, the last 10 years, those bonds are really just providing safety. What are they paying a two to 4% dividend? They're not providing any income for people. Yeah. So, so capital group who runs American funds and their mid-year, their mid-year outlook, they have a whole section with compelling reasons on why bond investors should not bail on their position right now. And it's all alluding to rising yields and bonds and if these yields get better if you're like if you're a traditional 60 40 that 40 percent the outlook for that is actually starting to increase now we're going through some pain to get there right because we had to have inflation we had to have rising interest rates um but i just thought that was i thought that was a good article because for what the last two years one of the big headlines has been the death of the 60 40 and this is now, I think, the second or third article that I've seen talking about the outlook for 6040 is improving. LPL Research just put something out on that. Now it's recently. Rethink the death of the 6040. It might not be dead after all. And once again, it was a headline. Yeah, the 6040 portfolio on bonds were yielding zero. It was hard to keep up, but we've had a market that's done so well. It stills at. It's historical average, the the 60, 40 portfolio. Um, six out of health, out of pocket healthcare expenses. Most people are not, they're not planning for what healthcare is going to cost. A retired couple age 65 going to need an estimated $300,000 to cover their healthcare costs in retirement. This that's over the life. Yeah. That's over their retirement. Yep. Okay. This doesn't include long-term care. That that doesn't include a long term care stay. No. So long term care is in addition. Yeah. In addition, a lot of money. People, aren't, how do you plan for that? Some, you should plan for that spending. You got to have a way to plan for it. Estimated monthly retirement spending. This is the number one thing you have to know. We had someone come in yesterday. How much are you spending? I don't know. You can't retire. How do you it's retire the, if you don't know what you spend? It's the most important piece of the puzzle. <laughs> it's. It's impossible to retire, and here's why. Once you retire, let me back up. When you're working and you make a financial mistake, you go buy a car you, you can't afford, you go get a credit card you can't afford, you've got some time to make up for your indiscretion mistakes. If you're 70 and retired and you make a money mistake, how easy is it to make up for it? It's not. It's not, you're not gonna make up for it. You're not gonna go get a great job or deliver pizzas or do that other stuff to make up for the mistake you made. So if you don't know what you're spending, the likelihood of you making a mistake is quite high. How much your home is worth? You probably want to know what it's worth, but I'm going to tell people I've never viewed my home as an investment. My home is a place to live. It's where I'm going to live. The only time your home turns into an investment is if you sell the house and you take the money and buy something less expensive. So let's say you have a house worth $500,000 and you retire and you sell the house and you buy something for 250. Then arguably you could call your previous home an investment. How many people, Elias, over their lifetime buy a house that's less expensive than the one they move from? 
Not many. I think we actually see retired people like building a dream home when they re- or they or, go from or they go from house to condo, but it's a lateral move. Correct. It, it's not like oh, we're going to go from a four hundred thousand dollar house to a two hundred thousand dollar condo because it's just not the lifestyle they're used to. I'm sure there's some people that do that. It's just not common. Yeah, for every hundred people, there's one that sells their house and and buys an RV or like a a camper and a truck, and they dramatically downsize. But how many people actually do that? I've had one. Cl- I've had one client who sold everything, farm, house, everything, bought an RV, and still on the road three years later. <laughs> I don't know bad. how long it'll last, but my guess is probably go back to house. I had another client who's in Arizona. They had a house here, house or kind of here, house in Arizona, sold the house, bought an RV. They're buying a house again in Arizona again. The RV was fun for about a year. Yeah, so they're, and I'm sure the house they're buying is equivalent to what they lived in before. Yeah. Um, number nine, you should know how much you have saved. Strictly just so you can start making projections. I mean, most people know what they have saved. Ten, you should know what your retirement age is. Retirement age, I mean, retirement age for people used to be 65. Like, everybody just said 65. Most people that come in today, it's not 65. There's a few that'll say that. Some it's 67, some it's 59. It's really all over the board. And I think it's because people have realized they're going to be less dependent on Social Security. And I think also the advent of the side hustle. There's a lot of people who are like, hey, I could retire at 62 and go do the hobby that I like and make money. So I think about a client we have in Texas. He loves airplanes. He's like, well, I could just retire at a certain age and then I'll just go be an airplane mechanic. Like in my part time, that'll be my job to take me all the way to when I really quit working. Yeah, because you can retire yeah, retire from a job, but whether it's gig economy or in that sense, a, a hobby job. Still going to have some sort of income coming in from working. And number 11, how much savings you need from retirement. And we get the question a lot, Elias, how much do I have to have saved? You know what my answer is? I don't know. There's only one way to find out, doing a financial plan. We back into what you need to have saved. And what I mean by that is we figure out what you're spending, what kind of lifestyle you want to live in retirement. And we try to figure out, based upon those factors, you're guaranteed, all these things we just talked about, guaranteed income, income sources, how much you know, what you have saved now, that's how we figure out how much you need to save. Some people need two and a half million. Some people need 5 million. Some people need 500,000. It's different for every single person. When someone goes out there and says, you need a million bucks. Well, okay. You need a million bucks to live one lifestyle that may or may not be enough for you. And that's a popular, that's probably a very popular comment we get is, well, I've always heard you need a million bucks to retire. Is that true for some people? Yeah, that is true. For some people, it's less. For some people, it's more. It just like you're saying, it depends. I mean, I work with a few people that their Social Security checks are more than their bills every month. So their retirement savings is, it's nice that they have it and they want it, but it's all, it's a, like irrelevant for their monthly income because they don't have any debt. They make more off of a pension and Social Security and they don't need the money. So those people could literally have no retirement savings and they'd still be fine. Right. Well, it's kind of a fun show. If anybody needs any help getting a financial plan done, wants to talk to one of our planners, you can go to btwellshow.com. Elias, thanks for joining the show. Do you have any closing remarks? Uh, Yeah, just everyone, thanks for listening. It's another good show. (laughs) 